Before we begin this podcast, please be advised that the following episode contains language that some listeners may find offensive and inappropriate. The opinions expressed by the host and guests are their own and do not reflect the views of the podcast producers. Listener discretion is advised. As far as your story goes, you're literally an, an innocent man that just didn't tell. Apparently they were having meetings on killing this guy. And all of them knew about what was fixing to happen. You're talking about a military trained man here. He's trained in this kind of stuff. I'm spooked. I'm like, hold up, what the fuck just happened? As far as I can remember, like I said, we were both in it. We were both there. We both were a part of it. Man, the, things would be so much different in your life right now if you'd have ran out of that house. Actually, I started to laugh. You laughed at it? Because I knew there was something more. I've always had hope that there's something more. You are now listening to the podcast Voices of a Killer. I'm bringing you the stories from the perspective of the people that have taken the life of another human and their current situation thereafter in prison. You will see that although these are the folks that we have been programmed to hate, they all have something in common. They are all humans like us that admit that they made a mistake. Will you forgive them or will you condemn them? They are currently serving time for their murders and they give us an inside glimpse of what took place when they killed and their feelings on the matter now. Here are the voices of those who have killed. On December 6, 2008, Stephen Rash, an elderly Springfield man, was found lying dead with his throat cut in the kitchen of his West Chicago Street home. The subsequent investigation identified not one, but six individuals who had orchestrated a complex murder-for-hire plot. Among them was 25-year-old William Reed. To this day, William has repeatedly maintained his innocence about the crime and claimed that he was unwittingly drawn into a murder scheme he knew nothing about. In this week's episode, we investigate the facts of Williams' case, giving him the platform to set the record straight and tell his unfiltered version of events 16 years later. We'll unpack the extramarital affair that motivated a deadly conspiracy and learn how William found himself mixed up in a toxic family saga. With six conflicting testimonies, this case is riddled with inconsistencies and hidden agendas, as each of Williams' co-defendants pointed fingers to shift blame from themselves. But as we cut through the details of this case, there are only two key people who truly know what happened inside the victim's house that December evening. Join us as we interview these two individuals and seek the answers that lie at the heart of William Reed's case on this episode of Voices of a Killer. Tell me, William, where are you from? I'm from Tennessee. Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. How long did you live out there? To the age of 10 years old, they moved me to Clarksville, Tennessee. Okay. So. Did you have a good childhood? How was that like? I was in an abusive home. I went through a lot of domestic abuse with my mom and dad. My brother beat on me and tortured me physically, emotionally, and mentally. That was basically my childhood. Yeah. Did your parents, were your parents together while you were growing up? They divorced or what? Well, they separated three different times when I was together, but they always got back together. So, I mean, basically they were off and on. Did your parents do any kind of drugs or alcohol? I think my dad drank. His mother ran a bar for 35 years. And other than that, I don't really know. Were you ever arrested as a juvenile or kicked out of school or anything? Yes. I went from 14 to the age of 18 in juvenile. The age of 12, I was in rehab. That was my first encounter with the police department. What did you go to rehab for that age? I had a 0.25 alcohol level, and they found massive amounts of cocaine and THC in my system. How would you get into cocaine at such a young age? I was cooking crack cocaine. I learned to cook crack cocaine because I wanted money and wanted what all these stars had. So I decided, okay, this is how they do it. I'm going to learn this. But you ended up using your own supply? Right. 
So at what time did you move to Missouri? I moved to Missouri the first time in 2006. And I worked for Missouri Valley Plaster Company doing stonework. And I was doing masonry. And I ended up moving out and coming back in 2008. Back to Tennessee? Yeah, I moved back to Tennessee, and then I moved back in 2008. So did you get into lots of drugs and, and legal activity in, while you are in Missouri? Well, it wasn't so much drugs as it was I was smoking weed and drinking and trying to find a job, and it was hard to find a job in the state of Missouri. Why is that? With no ride and nothing like that, I was not wanting a minimum wage job because I was a mason by trade. And I wanted a masonry job, and it's hard to go back and forth to a job site with no ride. So, so what'd you do to make ends meet? I went and sold a little bit of drugs here, a little bit there, to make ends meet for me, and it turned bad for me real quick. William's story starts out 500 miles away from where his actual crime took place. Born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, he had a troubled upbringing. Like many who come from neglectful and abusive homes, William was spun down a dark path from an early age. He was barely a teen when he became hooked on hard drugs and before long found himself caught up in a criminal lifestyle. At just 12, he was in rehab for using crack cocaine. By 14, he was in juvenile detention, but prison time did little to deter William from a life of crime and he became a repeat offender, a product of a failed justice reform system. By 2006, William had left Nashville behind and relocated to Springfield, Missouri. A mason by trade, William initially found work at the Missouri Valley Plaster Company. But when that employment ended, he battled to find a new income to pay the bills. To get by, he turned to a familiar line of work, the drug trade. It was also around this time that William crossed paths with the Rash family. While living in Missouri, he became connected to five key individuals in the Springfield area. He struck up a relationship with Alexandria McNeely, with whom he had kids. Through Alexandria, he then met her mother, Teresa Rash, and her stepfather, Stephen Rash. At first glance, the Rash family appeared to be like any typical homegrown family living in the northern suburbs of Springfield. But family troubles were brewing beneath the surface. Somewhere down the line, William eventually split up with Alexandria who entered into a new relationship with a man called Troy Christensen. Then, Teresa Rash, unhappy in her marriage to Stephen, started an affair with Jeff Bloom, a neighbor who lived a few blocks away. Via his involvement with the Rash family, William was about to find himself entangled in a family saga that progressed from petty love affairs into something much more sinister. So, you're in prison right now, in life without parole, for a murder that you assisted with, you didn't actually, you know, commit the murder. And I think the prosecutors even agree with that scenario, but definitely you were accomplice. The first question I have for you is what is your relation to the victim? It was my kid's mother's stepfather. Your kid's mother's stepfather. Stepfather. Yes. And how would your relationship with him was good? good. He kicked me out on the street with my nine, they old kid over my drinking. I mean, other than that, he couldn't tolerate my kids being around for long periods of time, which their grandmother wanted to see them. So. Yeah. So was your girlfriend or wife at the time, is it Teresa Rash? No, that was his old lady. That, that was, was my kid's grandmother. That was your kid's grandmother, the victim's wife. So who's Jeff Bloom? Jeff Bloom was apparently Teresa Rash's boyfriend. So Teresa, which is the victim's wife, did she ask you to, to, to do something for you? She didn't ask me, but apparently she had asked my crime partner. Rusty Amos? Yes. So Teresa, the victim's wife, asked Rusty to kill her husband? Yes. Why? I believe it was over a insurance policy of some sort. They had been having meetings that I knew nothing about that I found in my discovery that, that, that they had this hit list of people they wanted dead. I was number 25 on it. Who had this list? Teresa and Jeffrey Bloom. 
They had a li why did they have a list of people to kill? I don't even know the reason why they had it. It was found though. I mean, who that's not really a normal thing to have is a list of people. I mean, who what kind of people were these? These were your normal day-to-day -day people that I thought they were around my kids. I had went to Jeffrey Bloom's house and my kids were staying there because my kids' mom and me had separated. So my kids were staying there, so I would go there periodically to see my children. And that's how I got involved with these people. There's other people involved that also got, I don't understand why these other co-defendants that weren't there at the scene and all that stuff, Troy Christensen was sentenced by honorable. Okay. Yeah. Apparently they were having meetings on killing this guy. And all of them knew about what was fixing to happen. Ah, co-conspirators. And they were all accomplices to it. Yep. And so Teresa asked Rusty Amos to kill her husband, and she also asked Jeff Bloom? I guess. And how That's did you what get, the paperwork was. And how did you get involved? I got, in, I got involved because he wanted to take me to the house, uh, Rusty. While he was doing this, he took me to the house with him. To do what? Kill I knew nothing. Yeah, okay. I knew nothing about what was fixing okay. to happen. So you just happen to be somewhere. Rusty approaches you and says, take a ride with me. Does he tell you right then and there, hey, I'm going to hurt somebody? Or, or on the ride there, He's this is what's going down. Tell me about that. He never told me anything about what was going down. He just said, we got to go get some stuff out of Teresa's house for. And I was like, okay, cool. Is it just Not a problem. Him? Right. It's just you and him. Just in the me vehicle? and him. Okay. Right. So y'all are riding across. Like, you're riding across Springfield, Missouri, and he just tells you go and get something out of Teresa's house, and he doesn't say anything yeah, about hurting anybody or anything, right? Nothing. Nothing of that nature. In November 2008, a few days after Thanksgiving, in a small house on North Summit Avenue, a plot was hatched to kill Stephen Rash. 63-year-old Stephen was an ex-military veteran who had served in the U.S. Air Force. Now an elderly man, he was living in a house on West Chicago Street with his 49-year-old wife, Teresa. Their marriage, however, was on the rocks. Teresa complained that Stephen verbally abused her and sought comfort in her lover, Jeff Bloom. Fed up, she was now eager to find an easy way out of her troubled marriage. Her primary motivation was to live freely with Jeff. But William also adds that Teresa had her eye on Stephen's life insurance money. So, in a binder with Jeff, the couple wrote down a hit list of the people they wanted to take out, with Stephen's name at the very top. Roughly a week before Stephen's death, a meeting took place. Teresa had roped Alexandra into the plans, along with her boyfriend Troy, and the group allegedly recruited William and his friend Rusty Amos to take Stephen out of the picture. According to a later police investigation, Rusty was initially reluctant to become involved in a murder-for-hire plot, but after being phoned repeatedly by Jeff, he agreed to kill Stephen for $1,000 in the payment of his rent. A date was set and the scheme was put in motion on December 6. During our conversation, William clears up what he sees as inaccuracies in reporting about the crime. William denies being part of the November meeting or having any knowledge of the plan to kill Stephen. In his telling of the story, Rusty was the mastermind who approached William about collecting some items from Stephen's house. And as they drove in Rusty's truck, William insists that he had no ill intent and was totally oblivious to the true nature of their visit. Instead, Rusty unwittingly drew him into the plan to harm Stephen. So whenever y'all get there, who's at this house? Well, Stephen Rash was there. The victim? The victim. The victim was there. Who? And I knocked on the... Nobody. There was nobody in the house except Stephen. Okay. Whenever you pull up, obviously the, the driver, who is Rusty Amos, he, he knows that there's a murder about to happen. What is his demeanor like? Because he's going there to do some pretty a bad act. What is his... Is he breathing d deep or what? He wasn't breathing. He was breathing normal. You're talking about a military trade man here. Okay. He's trained in this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. he's breathing normal. At this point in time in your mind, what are you there to do? I'm there to pick up some clothes and a suitcase of stuff for her. And you That's knock, what I'm there. And you knock at the door and what happens? I knock 
on the door and tell him, hey, man, I'm here to pick up some stuff. Where's and Rusty? he says, all right, come on. Rusty's behind me. And he says, come on in. So we walk in. And he walks in the kitchen, I guess, to get some pills or something to take, get something to drink or whatever. And Rusty follows him. Well, when Rusty follows him, he jumps on his back and cuts his throat and lays him in the floor. So whenever Rusty jumps on the victim, how long did the fight ensue? Tell me a little bit about the fight. When he jumped on him, did he fall to the ground? Did he turn around and fight back? He jumped on his back and put him in a suffocation hold. Oh, he's like, okay. And he, did he make him pass Like out? a rear neck and choke. A rear neck and choke. And he choke. passed out. He did pass out. Whenever he passed out, did Rusty pull a knife out of his pocket? He pulled a knife out of his boot. He did? It was a pretty yeah. sharp knife? Right. How was the victim laying? Was he face down or on his side? Yes. Yeah. He was face down. Did he grab his head and pull it back and slit his throat, or he just reached down there and sliced it? He just reached down and sliced it. Did he just do one slice, or did he have to carve a little bit to get it to bleed? No, he didn't carve at all. He just stuck it in one side and went all the way across it. And at this time, I'm spooked. I'm like, hold up, what the fuck just happened? So immediately, I get out of there. I leave. Mm -hmm. I leave. Nothing else to be said. There's nothing else to be done. So... At no point in time did you fight in the Sioux and you helped fight at all? I mean, you're just literally this guy that was brought to watch somebody kill somebody. You would realize that we all know that's possible, but certainly there's a little bit more to that, William. No. No, I never touched the guy. I never put my hands on the guy or anything like that. Okay. Was there a lot of blood that came out? There's a lot of blood there. What was it like watching that? It was scary. It was a point of, I thought I was next. What does he say to you after he slices his throat? He looks at me and he says, you say anything and you die too, along with your kids. And what did you say to that? I didn't say shit. What do you say to that? You leave and keep your mouth shut. Under the impression that if this could happen to him, this can happen to you and your kids. Certainly. Did not, did anything I come out? Of, did anything come out of your mouth saying, "Oh my God, new, what are you doing? What's going on?" Yes, I asked him. I said, "What in the hell did you just do?" He says, "Don't worry about it." So my question to you, and I'm sure everyone else that's hearing this right now, why did right. you run like hell? Run to the cops. Get out of there. Because I was all under the impression that if I would have went to the cops, this man knew where my kids were, and I didn't know who else was involved. And if he had took me to this house, Teresa had to be involved in this, okay? That's all going through my mind because I'm a paranoid schizophrenic anyway. Where's your kids at this moment? My kids were with Teresa, apparently. Man, that's a difficult one, William. It's obviously, you're sitting in prison. You probably know that the choices you made weren't the right ones. But right. as far as your story goes, you're literally an, an innocent man that just didn't tell in william's account of what happened on december 6th he portrays himself as an innocent bystander caught up in a messy altercation here's what we know from the official documents about the crime that evening Teresa rash went to a bowling alley with the rest of the group involved in the plot this gave all the conspirators a clear alibi while leaving stephen alone at his house for rusty to carry out the hit that evening Rusty and William pulled up and tried to use a key Teresa had given them to enter via the back door. When that didn't work, they resorted to knocking on the front door, making an obvious entrance as Stephen himself let the pair inside. From here, the details of what unfolded are hazy, as William's testimony conflicts with the police sketch of events. According to William, Rusty suddenly and unexpectedly attacked Stephen while William stood idle in shock. William describes Rusty as a cool-headed, steel-nerved military man who was composed in the chaos that ensued. Allegedly, Rusty jumped on Stephen's back and strangled him, then knocked him to the ground and sliced his throat with a boot knife. In this version of events, William played no role in the crime at all and was only a stunned onlooker watching Rusty's erratic act of violence. But one thing puzzles me about William's narrative. If he was truly innocent, why did he not turn straight to the police and expose Rusty? 
William's explanation is that his inaction came from a fear of his kid's safety, as shortly after killing Stephen, Rusty leveled a threat that intimidated William into silence. By remaining silent, William inadvertently looked guilty to the prosecutors, marking himself as a likely accomplice in Stephen's murder. We'll hear more about the legal proceedings after the break. So, I mean, well, let's take it a little bit further. So, after he, after that was said, how much longer did y'all remain in the house? I didn't remain in the house long enough to get to step out of it. Long enough to go. But y'all left together? Yes. I jumped in the freaking truck and was frightened. He said, get in the truck. Did and he, I jumped in the truck and was frightened. Did him or you go through his pockets or get anything out of his pockets? No. Did you watch him, the whole, your, the, the killer? Did he, was he in your sight the whole time, or did you leave him behind in a minute with the body? I left him behind. I mean, I went, he told me to go get in the truck. I went and jumped in the truck. He come out about a minute later. Yeah. So, two minutes later. So, William, once y'all got in the vehicle together, did he leave the knife behind? Was there blood on him? What was that like? No, he took it with him. Once y'all started up the vehicle and you're backing out, you're leaving, what was talked about right there? There was nothing talked about. It was silent. And how was his demeanor at this point? Was he breathing heavy? Did he seem really nervous, or was he calm? Oh, he seemed nervous. He put a dip in and freaking was drinking a beer, so he seemed pretty nervous. Were you drinking at the time, too? I mean, I grabbed a beer afterwards. At the house that where y'all committed? I grabbed Where the murder was committed? No, I grabbed a beer. When we got back in the truck, I grabbed a beer. Out of the truck? He had a six-pack sitting there. Where did y'all go? We went to his house. And How far I, from the victim's house to, is it to his house? About three blocks. When y'all got there, what, what happened? I, he went and took off his clothes and washed his clothes and did some other things with, the, with whatever he had, and I took off. I left. I went up to commercial. I had a girlfriend that I was seeing on Commercial Street, and I went to see her. And I didn't say nothing about it, what had happened. So you didn't go see your kids? No. No, I wanted to stay away from my kids at this moment because I didn't know who else was involved and what they were going to try. I did call my kids' mother, though. Did you tell this girl that you went and met what happened? No. No. I was scared to tell anybody anything. So from the time that this happened, how many more times did you see Rusty, the killer? About three. Three more times until you were caught? Yes, well, so those three times that you saw Rusty, what were those discussions about? Nothing. It was just basically, hey, man, how you doing? It was, how's things going? He never said, hey, remember, don't tell nobody. No. Wow. No, there was no kind of discussion of that. And how did you know that the victim? I had spent maybe a month at his house. So you know this guy, you're friends with him, right? I wouldn't say friends, I would say I knew him. As mm-hmm. far as friends, he didn't really like me too much. Did you did you go to the funeral? No. He was cremated, from what I know. What was the discussion like around your area that somebody died in your circle and got killed? Throat slit. What was the discussion like in Springfield in your area? Well, it was somebody got killed. They had been they were looking for certain trucks and I was watching the news, and they were looking for this and that, and they were showing camera footage and all this stuff, but they really didn't give no details of anything. So, obviously, they're going to find all the people that were connected to this guy, and you were connected to him at some point. So, you got to know that you're going to be a suspect somewhere down the line. Oh, yeah. Were you nervous at this time? Oh, I was nervous as hell. Who wouldn't be? And how did you get end up getting caught? Did you go and uh, confess or what? No, I went into my probation office, and I was on probation for a second-degree robbery. And I went into my probation office, and apparently when he found out I was there, they had already called my probation officer and told my probation officer to let him know when I got there. So the detectives walked in and told him that they wanted to speak to me. 
So I was like, okay. So I went with the detectives and went and talked to them. And they had come back and charged me with murder after eight hours. So they... I was sitting popping pills when they would leave the room, and they charged me with murder after eight-hour interrogation. So what was the interrogation like? The interrogation was really spooky because they were asking me all these questions, and I kept telling them, man, I was there, but I didn't touch this guy. I did not touch this man. So with me putting myself on the scene, they charged me with acting in concert with another. After Stephen's killing, Rusty and William left the crime scene together in Rusty's truck. Their first stop was Rusty's house, where Rusty washed the clothes and disposed of the evidence. After this, in William's account, the pair parted ways, with William heading to a girlfriend on Commercial Street. Meanwhile, back from the bowling alley, Teresa reported her husband's death to the police, and in the days that followed, the story lit up on local news outlets. Despite Rusty's demand for payments for the hit, no money was ever exchanged. What makes this case unique is that there are so many co-defendants involved in the murder of a single man. Unfortunately for the group, the more people who have direct knowledge of the crime, the greater the risk of discovery. In the end, the unraveling of the scheme began with Jeff Bloom's wife, Karen Gardner. Shortly before Christmas, Karen was kicked out of the house she shared with Jeff after catching Stephen in bed with Teresa and overhearing him threatening to eliminate her if she caused any trouble. Karen, suspecting that Teresa and Jeff were involved in Stephen's death, went to the police and reported her suspicions. This triggered the arrest of all six co-conspirators who were rounded up and taken into custody like a fallen pack of dominoes. Among them was William Reed, who was arrested at a meeting with his parole officer. Did Rusty end up telling him what happened and, and, and laying it all out, or did he plead not guilty? Well, he told him that he had done the murder, but I had held the guy down while he did the murder to bring me down. And so that's what was said against you, that you actually helped hold this guy while he slit his throat? Right. And you can say with all honesty that's not what happened? I can say with all honesty that's not what happened at all. Yeah. Man. The, things would be so much different in your life right now if you'd have ran out of that house and just said, hey, this guy just took a life. Right. I'm not trying to beat the dead horse in the ground, but it's wow, that one, one, one decision you made fucked your life. So, William, do you play guilty or not guilty? I played not guilty. What were the charges, first degree or second degree murder they were charging you with? First degree. They got me a first degree murder. And you had a jury trial? No, I had a bench trial. I had a bench trial in order to get the death penalty off the table. So that's how that works, huh? When they're charging for first-degree murder, if you select a jury, then that means that there is the death penalty on the table. And if you select right. bench trial where the judge decides he cannot, you cannot be sentenced to death per the law? Right. I didn't know that. So you were pretty scared of the death penalty, and you chose a bench trial. And you wound up with Judge Holden or Mountjoy? Judge Holden. And that was probably in your favor, you thought, as well. Right. Because he's a light judge. What was that like hearing Judge Holden say guilty? Actually, I started to laugh. You laughed at him? Because I knew there was something more. I've always had hope that there's something more. That someday my story will get out and somebody will hear this and know that, hey, we can help him. You got life without parole, right? I got life without parole at this point. The odds of you getting out, or and I'm not trying to beat you up, it's just I see this constantly over and over again. You guys got hope, man. Like, a law changed for you. They're going to do something, like, to let you out. And with your case, man, it, it, they should, if really, especially if you really didn't hold them down, but... Life without is very harsh. And if it's just somebody that's a murderer, a convicted murderer, saying that you did this, is there anything else out there? Are you being involved in talking about it in text messages or anything? No, not at all. There's no documents of you being in this circle talking about harming him or whatever. Not killing him, just saying, hey, I'll, we'll get this guy or fuck him, whatever. No, there's nothing like that anywhere. So after you laughed at Judge Holden, what happened? He didn't say anything else. 
and they took me out of the courtroom. Did you say anything on the way out? Were you yelling at him or anything? Nothing. I kept silent. Why did you laugh? Because I knew that there was some something somewhere. There's something somewhere going to break. This ain't the end of everything. Have you exhausted all your appeals yet? I shut down my appeals 15 years ago. And there's a couple of things that now I can go back that I didn't know because I was on Thorazine and all this stuff for 10 years. I was on medication here in DOC. They had me on tranquilizers, heavy tranquilizers. Yeah. And uh, now I'm finding out that I can go back and pull this out and they have to go back into my case. For what? For my psychological evaluation, me being diagnosed with ADHD, ADD, bipolar type 1 with schizophrenia, with audio and visual hallucination, and PTSD and anxiety. So you're so and antisocial behavior disorder. Yeah, so what you're telling me is that they can bring your trial back or what? They can take this because they were supposed to do a psychological test in a murder trial. Like trial and they never did. Right. They were supposed to do an examination on any first degree murder. And they never did. And that's a going thing here in Missouri. That they don't do these things and they just throw people in prison. So what's it been like in prison since you've been, uh, what is it, how many years you've been in there? I've been in 15 now. You're at JCCC, right? Yes. What's it like there? Oh, it's crazy. I mean, it's this is supposed to be the trans center of the prisons, and this is the worst prison I've ever been in. The food is horrible. As far as the staff, half of them can't speak English. They use signs to communicate with us. As far as the inmates, some of them are good. Some of them are bad. You have to watch yourself and everything you do. So, I mean, it's are a typical you, prison. Are you patched up with a gang? No. No, never have. When's the last time you've been in a fight? That was in 2020. What happened? I was in Potosi, and I got into it over at Hable. A guy had disrespected me. I put some cups out to save some seats for me and my partners, and he walked up and moved one of the cups. And I said, man, did you see that? And he says, I'll just whoop you and walk out the outdoor, come back in the indoor. And we got into a fight. So that was that fight that got me moved out of Potosi. Did they pepper spray you? Oh, yeah. So now you've exhausted all your pills. You're hoping that your medical issues will basically have a like some, like trial de novo. All right. How do you resolve yourself knowing that your chances are slim? Well, I have a couple of lawyers that are wanting to go pro bono on this case right now. And they're investigating it as we speak, trying to determine what they can and can't do. After a bench trial, William was found guilty of first-degree murder. In March 2011, Judge Holden of Greene County officially sentenced him to life without parole. This is the harshest possible sentence a judge can give, and it usually is reserved for the most serious crimes. Effectively, it means that William will never be released from prison up until the day that he dies. Immediately after receiving this sentence, William had an odd reaction to the news. Some defendants sobbed when they were convicted, others erupted into rage. William's response, however, was to burst out laughing. His abrupt laughter was a reaction to what he saw as a deeply unfair and blatant miscarriage of justice. To this day, William insists that he is an innocent man who has found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time and argues that he has been wrongly convicted with no shred of hard evidence tying him to Stephen's murder. In the years that have followed, William's recourse has been to campaign for his release in the hope that one day he might be exonerated. For now, William has exhausted all of his appeals and, with no chance of parole, his odds might look grim. But William is pursuing a new avenue which is starting to gather momentum. It hinges on some of the missteps taken in his initial trial. A mandatory psychological evaluation was not conducted. In the present, William has been diagnosed with a host of mental health issues that could have impacted the course of his trial. Proper protocol was not adhered to and William hopes that this could help to overturn his conviction and give him another opportunity to face trial again where he might receive a different outcome. 
even if all this pans out, William might hit one more snag in the form of his co-defendant, Rusty Amos. Since 2008, Rusty's testimony has implicated William and undermined his insistence that he is truly innocent. More on that after the break. Well, how about I do this? How about I call Rusty and ask him over the phone? You think he'll talk to me? I don't know. I don't know if he'll talk to you or not. Well, I'm going to try to reach out to him, and perhaps he will say something differently, but it it sounds like I don't know why he would do that to you. Do you know? I mean, considering that we were friends and all, I think it was all of, he was involved in that and wanted the money out of it. So he was going to take everybody down if he went down. Yeah, but why? You know what I mean? If it lessened, right. his, if it lessened his sentence or he was trying to get you back because you told on him or what's – that doesn't make sense for him. To, you know what I mean? I'm thinking it was he was trying to get me back because they had us all in different interrogation rooms. Let me ask you this. Is it possible that – you didn't realize somebody was going to get killed and you grabbed the guy and y'all were wrestling around and he just took a knife out and slit his throat while you were holding him. No. Okay. okay. No, I never touched him. Yeah. There's none of my DNA in, on this body. Sometimes I, I think I've, I have one more episode with a girl. It's not released yet where she was going somewhere to, and knew that there was going to be a murder happening, but I think that she actually didn't really think it was going to happen and was just going along with this kind of thug mentality. And when she got there, a murder happened. And it's, oh, shit, okay, we did do this. And and obviously you're not going to say that's what happened to you, but sometimes that kind of shit happens where it's, hey, man, we're going to take care of this guy. Okay, let's go. And it's, yeah, we're going to, I'm going to shoot this motherfucker. Uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then it really does happen. And you're like, okay, we were really doing that. So it's like uh, when you're the just the guy riding along. But it's crazy that somebody would, tell on you and lie saying hey this guy held him down i'm trying to figure out why he would do that to you i don't know i mean that's got to be very that's got to make you very angry to have somebody do that to you oh yeah it angers me to no end but i'm also a true believer in christ and i know that vengeance is his i can't touch that man is he in the same prison i could yes Okay, well, then I'll definitely be able to get in touch with him. Is he in the same housing unit as you? No, he's not in the same housing unit. I tell you what, man. That must... If somebody did that to me, I would work my way to his housing unit for sure. That's big, dude. I don't know. I'm not... I see it as... I see it as God would take care of it. If I was to go and do that means I will never get out of prison. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reach out to Rusty, and then I'm going to let you know what happens when I talk to him. I think All right. That, I think that would help you tremendous amount if he would say or slips up and says something that helps you, and this will go where anybody can hear it. So I'm going to get in touch with him. I'm going to email you and let you know uh, what happens, and then I'll get you back on, But and then we'll go from there, okay? All right. Thank you. Yep. All right, man. Take it easy. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. The caller has hung up. One of the striking parts of this case is the number of people who were implicated in the scheme to kill Stephen. To date, six co-defendants have been tried and sentenced. Alexandria, Troy, Teresa, Jeff, Rusty, and William. This has led to inconsistent stories, inaccurate statements, and backstabbing between the members of this group. Shortly after the six were arrested, Greene County Prosecutor Daryl Moore noted that all of the suspects were quote-unquote pointing fingers at each other from their separate interrogation rooms. It was Rusty Amos' account that discredited William's story. Rusty claims that William was actively involved in Stephen's murder and as the only other person present in Stephen's home that night. Rusty's testimony matters. Today, William feels betrayed by Rusty and continues to deny his involvement. He suggests that Rusty might have wanted to shift the blame away from himself when he realized the trouble he was in. But could Rusty really be lying, as William claims? 
What would motivate somebody to condemn their friend to a life in prison? Perhaps if Rusty's story was made up on the spur of the moment for investigators, he might be willing now to edify or even recant his initial testimony. There's only one way to find out. I reached out to Rusty to hear his side of the story. What follows is his account of that December night. Hey, Rusty. Hey, hello. Hey, man, I really appreciate you calling me back. Now I finally got some time to talk to you. So I basically interview people that are locked up that are down for murder and just kind of you know, ask questions about it. Well, the thing is, I'm talking with William Reed, co-defendant of yours. Yep. And uh, you guys have kind of a unique story, but William, he's telling his whole story, and it's quite interesting because he says he didn't have anything to do with it, and he's innocent. But your account of it is that he actually did help. He he held the, the victim down while did what you did. Is there... Any way that if this guy's innocent that you would be able to say, yeah, he really didn't do anything or did he really do something? Well, that would, yes be hor- no. that would be horrible for somebody to be in prison for something they didn't do. It would be like a really big thing if you were to say, hey, I got that wrong. He really didn't do anything. Yeah, but that's not exactly the case either. Would you mind telling me, Rusty, about what role he took in that? Well, I mean, as far as I can remember, like I said, we were both in it. We were both there, and we both were a part of it. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm ultimately the one who did the final deed. Yeah. Did William actually grab a hold of the victim? Yes. 100% sure? No no question about it? No, no question about it at all. Did he know what was happening whenever y'all went there, like y'all were going to actually kill someone? I mean, I can't speak for him himself. I mean, I know that I had no intentions on killing the guy. But that was what the agreement was. Teresa wanted him dead, and you were going to get paid to do that. Isn't that right? Yeah, but that's what they were thinking. I I had no intent on killing the guy in the first place. So what was the purpose of going over there? Because this, And you could correct me if I'm wrong, because my whole podcast, and that's what this is, obviously, is is for me to get your side of the story, not to go, because I don't think the prosecutors and the news always get it right, and that's why I do what I do. So you can have your your say in it. And it doesn't mean what you're going to say is honest, but at least it evens the playing field. So, you know, you didn't think you were going over there to kill somebody. You That's not what your job was to do, to get paid to do that? No, I mean, did I honestly think that they could afford to pay somebody? No. I figured it was a bunch of bullshit, a bunch of hy- hypotheticals and everything else. Well, I mean, Re- you, or- you, you, you slit somebody's throat. What would cause you to do that, Rusty? In fact, he hit me in the side of the head with a lead, with an aluminum pipe. What caused y'all to get into it? Because he invited you guys in there, right? Is that? And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. And then what was the discussion like when y'all entered into the room? I stood by the door because I was only Reed's, Reed's ride. Because he said he wanted to go over and talk to him about how he was treating his kids. To go over there and talk about Teresa and how he was treating her? Well, how Stephen was treating Reed's kids. Yeah. So this guy was basically being abusive to some children and, and Teresa? Apparently. Like I said, the rest of them are family. Yeah. I was just somebody that William was living with, Reed was living with. So, I mean. Who made the first move in there, in the house? Reed. What did he do? He snatched up old boy by his throat and drug him off in the kitchen. She put him in a troll cold and backed off into the kitchen, and that's when I stepped in. Actually, I was going to try to get Reed off of him. But as soon as I stepped into the kitchen, he hit me in the head with a pipe, which was meant for Reed. Because when I walked in, he was in the middle of swinging, and I just happened to be at the wrong place. And he caught me instead. Well, So once when he swung this pipe and hit you in the head, was it y'all three all in the kitchen kind of squared up with each other? Pretty much. I mean, Reed still had a hold of him. Oh, he still had a hold of him? Out. Yep. Yeah. What was that like, slicing somebody's throat? I mean, to me, I mean, I, I don't know if Reed told you or not, but I'm prior service military. Yeah. There's a lot of military so, guys out there that have never slit a throat before. I mean. I understand. But they are also trained there to, to act, not think about it. Do you regret That's what exactly you did? What to a point. I mean, like I said, he attacked me first, so. Did y'all tell the you know detectives that it was self-defense? Or because y'all went over there to. to approach the guy, it wasn't. I tried to tell him it was self-defense, but they wouldn't listen to me. Well, I think that 
because it doesn't matter if it's self-defense because of the knowledge of just what was said about y'all going over there. There was a meeting beforehand that all that matters that once you get there, self-defense doesn't work anymore because y'all had ill intent by going over there. Whether it was to kill him or to hurt him, somebody ended up dying while in an ill intent was intended. That's how the law takes care of those situations. And like I told the cop, how many times have you heard somebody say that I'm going to kill him or I'm going to kill that dog or that dude or whatever, just in speak? Had y'all been knowing this guy for a while? I didn't know him at all. I met mean, Reed in County about a month and a half, two months prior to that. Wow. That's a crazy situation, man. Um, and what's funny is William says that you're the one that put him in the chokehold and he just stood there and watched, didn't touch him, didn't know what was going on, nothing at all. No. And then it's kind of crazy because y'all are both in the same prison. And I told him, I'm like, man, <laughs> if I was really innocent and somebody told on me, I would probably be trying to get to the other side of the prison where they're at. But he didn't have, he said he wasn't going to do anything like that. So, but. Uh, we, we stop and speak to each other every time, or speak to each other every time we see him, see yeah. each other. So how long did it take after this happened? Did you get arrested? I want to say maybe three weeks or so. What was that like? Those three weeks after you'd killed somebody, were you scared? Not really. I mean, it is what it is. You can't change the past. You got sentenced to life without parole? Yep. How does that feel knowing you're going to die in prison? I don't think about it. You don't think about it? Try not to, anyway. How about whenever I ask you, what does it feel like? No, I mean, it's, like I said, it, it is what it is. There's nothing I can do about it besides so behave myself, and hopefully the laws will change at some point. Do you have hope that maybe a law will change that you can get out? Yep. Do you think after doing something like that, you deserve to be out? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody deserves a second chance. Yeah. How's prison been for you? I mean, it's, I lucked out and happened to land around people that actually put me in the right path. So I've been pretty much doing nothing but working and minding my own business still here lately. So. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I, list, uh, I I appreciate you reaching out to me, and I'm going to talk to William again and say that he may be innocent or he may not be, but one of y'all is telling the truth and one of y'all is not. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, anyway, all right, take it easy. Yep. Bye-bye. Sixteen years have passed, but Rusty's account of Stephen's death remains unchanged. After arriving at Stephen's house, Rusty tells us William locked Stephen in a chokehold. Fighting for his life, Stephen hit Rusty with a pipe. Then Rusty slit his throat while William held the aging man down. Rusty's narrative conflicts glaringly with William's. In his story, William is not a stunned witness to the crime, but an active participant in a murder who even first initiated the conflict by grabbing hold of Stephen. Currently, the wheels are in motion for William to pursue a new trial, and if that transpires, the facts of Williams' case could be looked at again. For now, as we try to piece together the story ourselves, we are left with two conflicting narratives from the only two people who were inside Stephen's Springfield house. One account is not accurate, but it's impossible to discern the truth ourselves. Is William truly an innocent bystander who was wrongly convicted by a negligent criminal justice system? Is Rusty deliberately skewing the truth to deflect blame onto his friend? Or is there something more to the story? The answers only lie with one of these two men. Stay tuned, this story is not over yet. We'll return to this case in an upcoming episode to give William another opportunity to respond to Rusty's accusations. On the next episode of Voices of a Killer. And this is, sounds kind of cheesy because you just don't sound like a killer. But I still ended up getting charged with two counts of first-degree murder. When the crack infiltrated your family, it really changed the dynamic of just about everything. This is what the drug dealers was doing to my family, so I guess I don't care. I do it to somebody else's family now as well. My back window explode, my car explode, but I just keep driving up out of there. You went through a transition from being a person that carelessly takes somebody's life to uh, somebody that you say that is not like that anymore. 
That's a wrap on this episode of Voices of a Killer. I want to thank William for sharing his story with us today. His ability to be open and honest is what makes this podcast so special. If you want to listen to these episodes weeks in advance, you can now do so by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash voices of a killer. There you will get access to raw interviews, unseen news coverage, and unique correspondence with the guests of Voices of a Killer. Head over to patreon.com slash voices of a killer to support the podcast. Your support is what keeps us passionate about bringing these stories to you. A big shout out to Sonic Futures, who handled the production, audio editing, music licensing, and promotion of this podcast. If you want to hear more episodes like this one, make sure to visit our website at voicesofakiller.com. There you can find previous episodes, transcripts, and additional information about the podcast. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your feedback helps us improve and reach new listeners. Thank you for your support, and we can't wait to share more stories with you in the future. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Toby, and we'll see you next time on Voices of a Killer.